All right, guys, so welcome to another episode of the Imperfectly Perfect podcast, rounding off the UK. We have got an incredible advocate towards mental health doing amazing things in this world. So I'm going to run through a quick bio and then we're going to get into some questions. So Natasha Hamilton, best known for being one third of Atomic Kitten, one of the UK's most internationally successful girl groups of the last 20 years, selling over 10 million records worldwide. The group celebrated numerous global number one singles and albums while they dominated the charts throughout their pop reign. Atomic Kitten were a tornado of talent that attracted numerous prestigious gigs, including performing for royalty. They sang alongside global superstars and toured the world. As a solo artist, Natasha performed with the late great Robin Gibb, and she was invited to tour with the legend that is Lionel Richie, who said he was blown away by her talent. Natasha's career spans 21 years, and aside from the many musical accolades, Natasha is also the proud mother four children and a renowned TV personality, actress and businesswoman. Wow. Tenacious and talented in equal measures, Natasha parked a pop career to plunge herself into the world of musical theatre. She marked a bold career move by landing a debut lead role in the highly acclaimed West End show Blood Brothers, playing Mrs. Johnston. A highly respected theatre actress, Natasha was later cast in the energetic and mesmerising role of Maureen in the Tony Award winning musical Rent. She toured the UK, taking on the original role of the ruthless, fame-hungry slimming guru Julia Fleshman in Kay Mellor's brand new musical Fat Friends with music by Nick Lloyd Webber. In 2014, after the birth of her fourth child, Natasha's health took a turn for the worse and she suffered a breakdown. This led her to reevaluate a career. After suffering years of anxiety and depression, she began looking at different wellness aids that would fit in with a busy lifestyle that could keep her feeling healthy and happier. Her journey has taken her to many places from working out in the gym, yoga, cognitive behavioral therapy, sound healing, chakra healing, Reiki, to ancient sweat lodge rituals. Oh, I'm interested in that. She also trained as a holistic therapist and trained in London at the International Institute of Anti-Aging to become a skin specialist. Natasha has now built a wellness business, Live Better Wellness, around... Ketones, mindset and education. She's well respected in the wellness sector, often being asked to speak about her life experiences to help other people seek the help and support they need. Wow, that is a bio. <laughs> First and foremost, welcome to the show, Natasha. That's a lady. She went, we're going to do a quick bio. And I was like, oh, that's quite a long one. <laughs> you know, I can, read, I, I can read quite fast. But you know what? I always say, because um, I was speaking to uh, Suzanne Shaw the other day and she was like, oh, maybe I should have made my bio shorter. I'm like, no, you own it. You've had an incredible career. So um, thank you, first of all, for taking the time out. What I love to do with the campaign is everyone knows you as this persona, um, incredible career. So we'll get into that. But obviously, I want to know about the person behind what many people don't see. So take us back a little bit about the start of your pop career and where you dream laid. Well, I was a very tenacious young child. Um, singing was my absolute passion uh, i'd say from the age of four when i got the lead role in the school play that was it you know my mu the music teacher at my school took my mum aside and said mrs hamilton you know your daughter's got something very special you know i think she'd be perfect in th like musical theater school but we couldn't afford that so my mum's like oh thanks <laughs> and you, you know i was always like dancing and singing and doing you know, local shows and stuff. It was at the, about the age of 12. I, like back in the 90s, every Sunday we'd go down the pub mm. as a family and there'd be a singer on and I'd get up and sing. And he was like, she's, you know, she's really good. There's a, I know this, like, it was called a show group. <clears throat> so it's where kids come together and we put on these shows and we basically traveled the country. So I ended up in a show group. But back then it was like work and men's clubs, social clubs, you know, it was dead smoky in the night. People had just clocked off from work and they were like, Whoa, you know, they were like quite rowdy. Um, and it was a hard place to learn a craft, but I loved it. You know, I'd come home from school on a Friday, I'd get all my, I used to have a bag, you know, one of those like suit bags with all my different costumes and my shoes and my tights and all kinds in it. And I just, I, every day I practiced, I bought back and back and tracks. Um, I was only allowed to sing between four o'clock when I come home from school and six o'clock because I grew up in terraced houses, so all the houses like were all connected. Yeah. 
So after six o'clock, it was, my dad was like, the neighbors need some peace. (laughs) So I knew I only had two hours to go to my bedroom, put the tapes on and belt out a load of Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey songs. Um, And that was just, you know, (laughs) yeah, I'd just be like back to back quick, get as many songs in as I could. Yeah, and that was it. So I I cut my teeth doing doing it like a cabaret, basically. I was the last generation of the cabaret kids. And I went from just being this little 12-year-old on stage to by the time I got to 15, everyone would stop drinking their pint. <laughs> or, you know, all their, their G&T and be just like looking. And at the end of it, all be stood up clapping. So I kind of knew my voice was something special. I mean, when I was younger, it, was, it really was special. Mm. I've not looked after it the way I should um, as I've got older, but it was exciting. And I left school. I was in performing arts college for four months and I ended up signing a 1.5 million record deal wow. to be in Atomic Game. I knew it was going to happen. I'd worked towards it from the age of 12. I was so sure I was going to be a successful singer. Obviously, I didn't know I was going to be in a pop band, Yeah, but I just, I kind of had a knowing. I just knew it was going to happen. That's amazing. Like, you know what, what I've learned in, in everything that I've done and met people, it's like when there's just, it's either a vision or they just know and it just comes. And I can even hear off the energy that you give talking about it now. There's so much passion still there for it. Like that, that young girl that got signed. When you went into that and was suddenly thrown into the limelight, how did you manage kind of your well-being through that for something from a working men's club and round of applause to then suddenly under the spotlight, maybe scrutiny, journalist, paparazzi? Um, I think in the early days, we just loved it. We were just kids and we were having a ball. We didn't really understand the consequences of what was to come. Right. You know, being harassed by the press, being constantly scrutinised, nothing you did was ever good enough. Then, you know, making a mistake in you know in front of a lot of people and it and then you're like the worst thing in the world and it's like they put you up to pull you down and we were just kids like we didn't we hadn't even lived a normal life I left home when I was 16 to travel the world as part of a pop band I hadn't made my life mistakes yet but whenever I did it was like total public knowledge um I just left you feeling very insecure um, but then the, the opposite side to that was people loved us, you know, the, the, the press made us um, kind of everyone aspired to be Atomic Kitten because we, were, we, can't, we weren't polished. We were just like the girls next door and we weren't making mistakes. So it was quite endearing. But there was no support. We didn't, you know, like in work now you'd have like human resources if you had a problem you'd go to someone and they'd be there and they'd help you out and stuff like that we don't get we never had that obviously we had a tour manager but everything was just like this is your job and you need to do it no really wasn't an answer so if you really didn't want to do something it'd get to a point where you'd literally be screaming and crying going, I don't want to do it. you know it was very dramatic and you know, then you'd be saying, I don't want to, like, I'm just not going to go to work. And then you'd have management on you. Then you'd have the record company on you. And it was just like, it was such a pressure cooker all the time. And can you, you know, I look at my kids now. I've got an 18 year old and a 16 year old. And I joined Atomic Kit when I was 16. And I look at them and I think the pressure that we had on us at that age, like, it was too much we were treated like um professional adults who had been in the industry for many many years but we were just working class girls so there was a lot of learning massive learning curves along the way um what and i suppose they like then huh for those people that see the highlight reels and just see the the finished product what was a typical day like Mental. So I'd say we were surviving on four hours sleep. Wow. Because our days were that long. Most of the time we'd be getting picked up at pitch black early hours in the morning, bundled in the back of a Chrysler Voyager. We'd have a pillow with us and we'd still be like literally getting out of bed to sleep, you know, like having a shower. 
getting in, going to sleep again. We turn up to somewhere. Half the time we'd like we do a makeup in the car. Just go straight into like a school gig. Um, so imagine if you're living in Liverpool, but you've got to be in a school in Scotland. Imagine what time you're getting picked up at like 2 a.m. <laughs> you know, it's like it was mental. Um, so our sleep was all mainly on the go, whether it was in a car or on a plane. Then we'd be doing like radio interviews, um, gigs, uh, photo shoots. It was, we were constantly having to be there and show up. Like the actual making music part is tiny. Yes. <laughs> tiny. You'd get like two weeks in the studio, if that, just to record it. And then everything else was promo, promo, promo. So you had to be on show 24 seven basically uh it was mental we got to a point where we couldn't get enough normal flights so we had just had a private jet <laughs> and that we just jump hop on and off that all day and all week long um you know we went from in the early days living in rather shitty hotels um <laughs> to like five star suites sometimes we'd have a butler which we hated because we'd be like there'd be like a man sat in a room just waiting for you to ask them for something we'd be like no <laughs> so, like yeah. we were kids we don't need a butler uh you know just mad really really bizarre stuff where you, you sat there going this is weird mm. But it was just a pressure cooker. It was a total pressure cooker. And it was getting intense anyway. And then throw into the mix, becoming a mum and having to tour and leave your kid behind. You know, it was inevitable. We weren't given the time to just be Natasha, you know, Liz, Jenny. We weren't given that opportunity. Yeah. We never had like a six month break. We never, we never had a six week break. Um, yeah, and inevitably, in the end, it was just too much for me. Um, I got ended up with postnatal depression. I hated leaving my son. You know, I was depressed. I was drinking to, you know, hide my pain. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I was just like, this isn't how I want to live. I don't want my kids to see me crying every day when I am there or not seeing me at all because I'm on some promo tour around Asia yeah. and I was taking him with me and my mum was coming with me but I'd leave when they were asleep in the morning and by the time I got back they'd be in bed yeah it's... that was even worse because it was like you're there but I still can't be a mum it was mental it really was mental Wow. And it wasn't all doom and gloom. Like we had an amazing time. I think if we were looked after a bit better, as in our mental health and our just just our health in general, we'd have lasted longer than the five years that we were we, we put in. But unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. So I suppose it made made you three tighter than ever because you needed that little bit of support, didn't you? Like yeah. To, to navigate your mental health whilst you're, you're at the height of stardom, plus you're trying to deal with everything, then I suppose you needed each other to lean on. But being yeah. together so much, again, that's going to be hard, like any kind of relationship. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> wow. I we loved each other. We also hated each other at times. But yeah. we, went, we went one of them pop bands where there was like actual like hatred in fighting. Hmm. We just were sick of each other. It was like, you know, a sibling. Yeah. You know, you're with each other 24 seven. You do each other's heads in. But yeah. the, we didn't hate each other. We just got on each other's nerves every now and then. <laughs> and it happens. It happens. Well, I, I get a lot of messages who people come to the campaign and there's a lot of people. There was actually one yesterday about the postnatal depression. So when you was going through that time, um, was it something that you tried to keep to yourself? Like, thinking that you could manage it yourself because I know a lot of people reach out and go I just didn't want anyone to know that I was struggling because I was a mother what about yourself for your journey and then when you did finally speak out what I'm trying to do with this is just like let people know that it is like a um a weight taken off your shoulder when you finally do get that advice what about yourself 
I mean, it was the biggest weight off my shoulder the day I got diagnosed with postnatal depression because I didn't know what was wrong with me. Mm. I was 20 years old. So we're going back now to um, 2000. So I had Josh in 2002. So I was, I just turned 20. Um, bearing in mind, the magazines I'd been reading were like just, you know, gossip magazines and stuff like that. And there was no other... 20 year olds in the public eye having babies talking about having postnatal depression mm. it was postnatal depression wasn't even spoken that much amongst older women so when i started feeling wobbly i'll just cut that label it wobbly <laughs> for now yeah i just didn't know what was going on and my fear was if i turn around and say to someone Bearing in mind, I'm at the height of my career. I've got a number one album, got number one singles, and we're number one in the compilation chart. We're literally smashing the, the life of being a pop star. And I'm lying in bed every morning, sobbing, going, I don't want to do this. I thought, how ungrateful am I? I am, un I have got the life of my dreams, and I don't want it. Like, I just, my brain was like, there's something wrong with you, you're ungrateful. So I just suffered in silence. And I, when I say I suffered in silence, I didn't tell anyone anything. But it was, it was very obvious something wasn't right. Mm. But I don't think people wanted to admit it because admitting it meant the show had to stop. Yeah. And it was almost like a dirty secret when I, like, eventually management did know because... No one kind of went, Tash isn't well, let's just, like, she needs time off, let's stop. It was very much, when are you coming back to work? How long are you having off? There was no understanding. There was definitely no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Compassion. Mm -hmm. Like, it was a horrible place for me to be in. Um, I was under the, you know, I had a, you know, under the care of a doctor and she just kept saying to her manager, she needs to stop. She needs a year off. I think I was given a couple of weeks off. And in that time I had several phone calls from several people saying, well, if you're just going to leave, let us know so we can get on with it. That was kind of their attitude towards it. So yeah, it wasn't nice. It was, it was confusing, it was heartbreaking, it was scary. And in the end, I just thought, fuck yes, <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> that was literally, I got to a point and I thought, I don't want, uh, this isn't what I want anymore. Yeah. So I, I, the only option was to leave. Wow. And then yeah. and you obviously moved through and you went through, like I was reading in your bio, the holistic approach and Reiki and cognitive behavioral therapy. How did you go with all that? Because I did cognitive behavioral therapy as well when I was doing the body, dis when, should I say, when I went through body dysmorphia. Totally different. It's so, what was your experience like? So I didn't actually end up doing CBT until after I had Ella. So this is like 12 years later. When I had Josh, I did go into therapy and um, it was the most difficult thing I ever had to do. Because I come back from like this northern working class background where mental health never got spoken about as a kid. You know, even my dad, bless him, he used to say things like, there's no such thing as depression. I, just because one, he'd never had it and he didn't understand yeah. But because I'd heard him saying that, that was what, what I used to think. So the thought of going to see a cat, like a, a, a therapist or, you know, go and sit in some room and talk to someone was like petrifying. <laughs> um, so I, I had to, I, I went through quite a few different people in, in the early days when I was 20. Mm. You know, the first place I was sent to was like Harley Street, which is like this posh medical street in London. Bearing in mind, I was 20, Scouser, you know, working class roots. And I'm literally sat in a white office with like this like psychiatrist, like counsellor woman, therapist. And I was like, I'm not telling you anything. I was so intimidated. I didn't say, I was just sat there going, mm, 
I couldn't open up. So I was, going, I was, you know, seeing here for a while and nothing happened because I wasn't, I didn't want to say nothing. I didn't feel comfortable. But once I'd left the band, um, to be honest, I don't know how I ended up get, going to see this woman. I don't know who put me in touch with that. But she was just a lady in a house. And I went in, I sat in her armchair. And I think for about the first four sessions, I just cried for an hour. We didn't speak. Mm. And she'd just be like, okay. And she'd like, our session's over now. I'd go home. <laughs> I just, nothing was said, but it was just, I felt safe. Yeah. And once I got, it was like four sessions of crying before I even opened my mouth to be able to figure out how I felt. Um, I think it's really important to find somewhere you feel safe. And I think mental health's addressed in a totally different way now. Mm. Like, there's so much help and support. But for me, CBT changed my life. I know that we're jumping a bit big, a big gap there. And I know we've only got a certain amount of time. But in 2015, I ended up having a breakdown. I was under the care of psychiatrists and the mental health team. This was after having my little girl. Because it was like the same, the same things were going on in my life. I'd never addressed anything. Um, so I had 18 weeks of intensive CBT. And to be honest, at the beginning, I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and on, on, on my last session, I cried. I was like, I don't want to go. Wow. It totally changed me. It changed how I functioned on a daily basis. It, and it made my life more positive, it enriched my life because I was in control of my thoughts mm -hmm. instead of my thoughts controlling me, which I, that had happened for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, it was just like taking the reins back of my own life. And then I was like, ah, okay. So in order to make a change, I have to change the things that aren't serving me anymore instead of being in the same loop, you know, just with it being a different day. So I, I learned so much about myself and what I needed to do to get out of the rut that I was in. And yeah, everything since then has just been onwards and upwards. Love that. Love that. And I think taking it back to when you was even talking about your dad, like me, working class background, Northern family, very much the same. But you have to really delve deep and go through that inner child healing to realize it's not just our parents, like you said before, ancestral. And we have to yeah. break it. And I found out I was putting money blocks on myself for ages because I couldn't receive because it used to be at a time where, you know, sometimes when you're younger and your parents, and it's not nothing wrong with them, but they're like, put it back, you can't afford it. That subconsciously goes deep and then you just can't, like, so I have- it is where is, and it's different with us because we really didn't have money but like when we did it was like right that just gets put on a holiday and we go and enjoy it you know so for me like saving money was that's my issue it's like I always suppose it was like oh well don't really have money but when we do have it we enjoy it so like money for me was like yeah let's enjoy it and then it's like oh yeah maybe what 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 saving money <laughs> You don't know, know anything about that. You know, when you used to travel all the time, did you realise, because I did when I moved to this side of the world, when, you, when you're in England, and I think it's amazing, but you save all year to go on your two weeks holiday, like in Ibiza or wherever. And when you go to the other side of the world, you're like, we actually live in England, in Europe. We can go there every other weekend, but we don't. We save all year to, to go away for two weeks. It's so, mm. like, I talk to my sister all the time, and I'm like, where are you going? She was like, oh, we're going away for two, three weeks. And I'm like, Europe's on your doorstep, go. And I'm only saying that now because it took me to move to the other side of the world to go yeah. more countries than ever. But uh, <laughs> so I love what you're doing now. Um, obviously, incredible career aside, but you've moved into the wellness space, 25 years in the health and wellness sector myself. I think it's amazing what you're doing. Tell everybody a little bit more about that. To be honest, it wasn't, I mean, I've had to look after myself. And since I've been doing that, I'm living a more fulfilled, happier life. So for me, your wellness and your well-being is something that has to be looked after every day. Like you need to be doing things on the daily. 
um, that enrich your life, whether it's, you know, 10 minute mindfulness or meditating in the morning, you know, reading your self-help books, like surrounding yourself with the right people, finding your tribe. It's all cliche. It, it works guys. <laughs> There's a reason why people flourish and blossom when they start taking control of the life, because everything in the world is energy. And when you you have the right energy around you, you feel good. I'm not saying I feel good every single day because I'm a woman and hormones and I'm coming to 40 and that's a whole other subject. <laughs> but you know, I've replaced all the things that don't serve me anymore. So, you know, foods, people, it's just like going out too much. Not that you can do that anymore anyway, but... Um, yeah, for, so for me, you know, when I started saying, well, exercise, I need to exercise because every time I exercise, as much as I hate it, it makes me feel good. So guess what? I'm going to exercise. It's like sometimes you need to do things that don't come naturally for the bigger cause. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so we went into lockdown and I lost all my gigs. Last year was going to be man and Liz's biggest year in seven years. And it was like... Yes, like I'm going to earn a decent wage this year and, uh, you know, I don't have to do the shit jobs. I can, you know, we're going to have loads of gigs. And that all went. So I was, I, I was like, oh, but the old Tash would have felt very overwhelmed, probably gone into a dark place and felt very sorry for myself. Mm. One thing I've learned is no one is going to come and save me. I am my own savior. It all lies within me. So I need to do something about it. I need to be proactive. So I was like, well, what can I do? What was important to me right then and there when we went into lockdown was feeling mentally strong, connecting with people and it not becoming fear. Like there was a lot of fear mongering on the, on, in the press. So I created a group. I was like, I'm going to do a Facebook group. I'm going to call it Live Better with Natasha. <laughs> I'm going to bring all my friends in who've helped me over the years. So, you know, coaches, therapists, um, people who were like experts in their field, whoever helped me, I just phoned them. I said, like, can you come and do a talk in this group to help people support them? Everyone was like, yeah. And it just stemmed from there. So I just created this community. It was a safe place. It was all about your physical, mental and spiritual well-being. because on my own journey, it can't just all be exercise. Yeah. It can't all just be diet. It can't all just be mindset. It can't just all be woo-woo. It has to be everything. And, you know, if you, you know, if you're honest and you sit down and you'd go, well, I work out seven days a week, but I still feel like shit. Well, look at the other as as aspects of wellness yeah. that you can be bringing into your life because it's too much. You need to balance it out. Um, and that's kind of how I've been living my life. Uh, it's a constant juggling act. I don't always get it right. I am far from perfect. You know, I still have my weeks where I plummet and I'm like, feel like I'm stuck in mud. But the tools I've learned is, well, what have I been doing and what can I improve? And I'm constantly, literally, I wake up, I go, what can I do today that was better than yesterday? And I've, I've almost got a, I can see myself from like outside looking down. It's almost like I can analyze myself a bit better. Um, I'm not just stuck in my head. Like, um, you know, like a swan, I felt like a lot of my life, I, I was putting on a show. Yeah. I was showing up, but underneath, you know, the legs were going like this. And I felt like I wasn't in control. I wasn't steering my ship properly. Whereas now when I get overwhelmed, I pause. There's so much power in the pause. It's in, that's one thing I've learned through like all my different um, sessions and counselings that I've done is being able to, when you go, uh, is stop, breathe, yeah. step back and go, what is this? What's triggered me? What can I do to feel better right now? I always like shot from the hip. I'd feel it and I'd go, ah! and I'd react to it. And now I am a lot better because I've introduced the pause and it's an incredibly powerful tool. Man, 
you, you can feel the energy radiate off you. Like, I love this conversation because it's all I'm about <laughs> now. Because I've gone and you have to go deep, don't you? And that's yeah. the thing. Like you spoke about it there, the, the frequencies, the energy. Like one of the things that I learned is the quickest way to raise your vibrational frequency is to step into your truth and own who you are. And you start attracting the people and the wellness and the balance. And I only learned recently with this campaign, whatever, the reason I was told it was growing was because I was balancing my, and I didn't understand this at first, my masculine energy and my feminine energy. So that clarity, the passion, and then masculine. And then I was trying something else on the side and I was very masculine dominated, like do, do, do. But I wasn't allowing myself that time. So I was putting blocks on myself and it wasn't until I, came back and someone said you need to look at yourself like you said from above at what you and I was like yeah so I started doing the Wim Hof method jumping in a freezing pool just for that that clarity and mm -hmm. well it, it's constant work and that's um I've got two questions for you what does and you said it before like you're not perfect what does being imperfectly perfect mean to you just owning your shit own it wholeheartedly I think people are terrified to grow and get out the comfort zone because they're so caught up on trying to portray perfection. Yeah. And the minute I just went, ah, this is bullshit. I am not perfect. Like I, I, some days I'm a complete mess. Like sometimes I just feel like, how have I even ended up with four children? It was like, well and safe <laughs> because sometimes but I don't beat myself up and it's like okay that was a learn like I've learned from that um you've just got to own it guys like nobody's perfect and to be honest no one wants to see that like for me my social media is being authentic to who I am you know and there'll be days and I'll just show up and, and I, I'll go into my group my live better with Natasha group and I'll be like I am, I don't feel good. And I will, uh, I'll have a cry. I'll just be like, I'm not feeling good. Like th this is happening because that's me. Like I am a power, like this ball of energy, but I'm also like this little softy as well. And I want people to see that, like, don't be afraid. It, it's not a weakness to show that you're not feeling good or things aren't working out for you because when you acknowledge it it's that's the first step to change so for me i just want to use the platforms that i do have to em one empower people and two to take away that pressure that people put on themselves like it's okay <laughs> no one's got the shit together no one has <laughs> And you know what, I've, I've just got to say, like, I love everybody on these episodes, but when it comes to the British, you know it's told the truth. And I, everyone's telling the truth, but I was talking to another British the other day, and you made me laugh internally there, because it was like, who was it? It was, well, it was, I was like, what does imperfect, sometimes we just shit, aren't we? <laughs> I was like, the Brits just come straight out with you. Sometimes we I do don't, shit. I do. And I do apologize because i feel like i have swore a few times <laughs> but that's just me like when i get passionate and that yep. um yeah i get a bit giddy but, that's but i love these conversations i love these conversations because it's it's for me it's just like a tiny little thing i can do to just pass on my energy to other people and say it's all right you've got this yeah. Oh, well, you know what? I, I just want to thank you for taking the time. Where can people, can people join this group and where can people find more information about you in regards to all your wellness stuff now? Okay. So if you're on Instagram, I am at Natasha Hamilton and my website link is on there. If you click onto there, I think live better with Natasha.com. Um, you know, there's lots of different things tabs on there so you can come and join my facebook group it's free um you can come and learn more about ketones which is the drink that i drink every single day that makes me feel on fire um you can you know i've got freebies on there i've got like a 
an ebook. I've got I've got all kinds. It's just like livebetterwithnatasha.com. I'm actually in the middle of rebranding as well because when I put this together, it was the beginning of lockdown and you know, fifth well, 12 months later, I'm in a totally different energy space. And so now I'm like, okay, time to maybe just tweak this a little bit. Live better with Natasha will always be there, but I'm actually going to bring something else, which is for people who are ready to tackle their um, well-being journey with a little bit of oomph and uh, come along and enjoy the ride with us. See, I can, I can, when I pick up on energy, I can see you using your platform when it all opens as a, as a huge public speaker in this arena. I know you're doing it now, but like to the masses, because your energy is just boom. Maybe it's because it's late at night in Australia and I'm like, she's full of energy because you're on morning. <laughs> you had your ketones. <laughs> what time? I've had my ketone. It's quarter past ten. I actually did a, a speaking, believe it or not, one of my fears is public speaking. Wow. And, you know, COVID comes along and I have to talk. So it's kind of helped me there. I did one public speaking event just before COVID. And it was the most terrifying thing I've ever had to do. You know, normally when I'm on stage, I'm singing. Yeah. But to actually talk to people, it, when I say my knees were knocking, it, yeah, it was, it was terrifying. And I ended up crying as well because I was you know, my emotions were high and I was telling my story about becoming the pop star and the parents and how it really didn't work for me. Um, but it was so liberating. And when you get to that point where you, you are ready to push yourself out of your comfort zone, um, it becomes quite the uh, exciting journey. <laughs> wow. Well, you've had a, a long journey. I just want to say on behalf of myself and the campaign and everything that you do for so many people, thank you very much. Oh, thank absolutely. you for having me. Absolutely amazing. And uh, I will put all the links up to uh, where you can find more information about Natasha. But again, thank you for your time. Guys, just simply go to Spotify or High Heart Radio where you can subscribe, like, and share this podcast episode and find all our latest episodes. But remember to keep having those hard conversations because it's the hard conversations that save lives.